when someone says right that hey you know what whoever made money trading stocks um, my answer is always simple it's the owner of the broking platforms mm-hmm. and it's a fact you know they they, they minted it in the last two years right uh, but the behavior was also not what i would say which would be unexpected very very hard yaar you know when when you show someone that you know you put 500 rupees in a in bitcoin and in two months it can be 50000 right so people start thinking of it as optionality number of active crypto accounts in india exploded to millions in like four months mm. or five months right so fact yeah. and and how do you fight that almost like a group think where every 23 to 26 year old is basically being told if you're not in a, in crypto you're a fool or if you're not in something else you're a fool right and um, so as an industry does education help education helps but you know sometimes an individual has to go through that experience themselves and then make have that realization for themselves that this is how the world works because uh, you know everyone thinks that the world is different in their age so let's get to the outlook section now <sighs> The stock market has not really gone anywhere like we were talking. What are you recommending to your users in equity? You know, uh, large, mid, small sector, theme, etc. What's your messaging to your users right now? In a real estate market, prices rarely is a market like India where there is no leverage. If there is leverage built in, all bets are off. But in a market like India where people don't take a lot of leverage to buy homes, prices don't correct. They just don't appreciate. so they are basically correcting by the rate of inflation year after year after year so for example one crore house in 2000 is still one crore in 2020 you will say no correction man i bought for one crore it's still one crore mm. you actually lost close to 50% yeah, yeah or more yeah. because of inflation right and i think um, my personal opinion is something like that is possible in equity markets which for a long term investor to be honest may not be the worst thing because you want to be you want to be able to accumulate Got a welcome to Bhasa Bhasa. Thank you so much for doing doing this again for our listeners. Thanks, Anupam. Thanks for having me back. And things have always changed. a pleasure. Yeah, yeah things things have changed since you were here last. Uh, you were here in the old studio. Yeah, and that was a very different era. I remember that because that was twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen. Everything was exploding in mutual funds. Um, you were on platforms actually. Um, you were on Bhasa Bhasa in August twenty nineteen. Four years, you know, and in this. <laughs> post i hope it's post pandemic world four years seems like 10 years plus yeah what's been happening eh? how have things progressed since then um what changed during the lockdown and what did not change during the lockdown very interesting question right so um i think online investing exploded during the pandemic but within online investing if you look at it trading exploded uh within the uh, during the pandemic and and i think like we were discussing earlier what really changed was that people went after um fno trading right day trading right crypto anything that had this promise that you could make money really quickly um and all kind of things right and there were people sharing pnls online and 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 that drew in a lot of people thinking that oh wow this is easy i'm going to just you know double every 3 months and retire in 2 years um of course you know life always has different plans and um on the mutual fund side you know things have progressed um we have been growing we are like about 4x or 5x on what we were at that time if you look at even in the macro space the sip book had a uh, you know 14000 crores highest ever last month yeah. we see the same thing on our platform people i think the long term investors are investing i think a lot of people are seeing the value of mutual funds a lot of people who have been investing for some time a lot of people who have been burned because they tried a lot of the other um um uh, you know be it thematics be it crypto be it whatever it is under the sun and um in the last part like you know if i if i if i don't think about platform then don't think about kind of you know products when when we started this digitization journey right and a lot of other platforms started with us there were two core promises at least in my view the first promise was everyone has access and i think um if i can speak for the whole collective group we did phenomenally well there um lot more indians are investing whether it's through dmat account whether it's through direct plans through regular plans doesn't matter whether it is in fractional investing it's real estate fractional investing or whatever it is but a lot more people have access right the second promise was that because of this digitization because of this percolation of knowledge the investor returns are going to improve 
that has not necessarily happened because a lot of the volume of investments and a lot of the focus of investments actually went into those get rich quick schemes right and that didn't play out um the way we expected it to play out and so we have to kind of as an industry now rethink then how do we build products that are actually beneficial for the end user if you have sebi saying that 90% of i think day traders don't make money right this is a net of cost they're not saying they don't beat the index they're not saying they don't beat uh, fds they're saying they don't make money right one of the largest platforms in the india in india comes in and says 99% of their users don't beat fd returns then something is wrong right is this a product that is democratizing wealth creation or is it not right i mean if it is democratizing wealth creation then you know at least 80% should beat fd returns right um in mutual funds we do see that majority of people do beat fd returns i look at my own cohort the average returns for my cohort uh, and we do this cohort analysis and we put it up on covera is like close to 10 11% 3 4% more than fds and at a better taxation right but um how do we kind of for for something like a broking uh, piece uh, of the puzzle or something like you know how do we get to a place where people get some kind of a thrill of using that product because i see why people go into broking it's more exciting it's more interesting right talking about a stock is a lot more interesting than talking about broad based indices how do we get that excitement and how do we um still ensure that you know 60 70 80% of the people are beating fd returns so i think um at least in my personal opinion there has to be a fundamental rethink on what should happen next in some of the more kind of you know trickier spaces of investing okay so in terms of identity this is something that i like to tell our listeners is because you know you need to differentiate between the guys who have only a platform which is aggregating buyers and aggregating manufacturers on one side you're different you're actually the smart guy you're actually a sebi registered investment advisor sebi ria which means that you can actually charge for the advice that you give so i want to talk about that advice So right. what's been happening in the advice ecosystem in the last 4 years since we were here remember in 2019 when you were here and club paisa paisa subscribers please do listen to that episode entire archives are available to you included in the subscription fee you we, we were talking about investor behavior you know right. what what we were saying is that gap that's called which is basically that the fund makes say 12% return but the investor makes only whatever 7 8% return because he's been selling in selling out and stuff like that uh, i believe it was the dalbar study also which did a lot of work out here yes. can we yes. talk about this advice thing you know because we live in an era where pretty much anybody can give advice on the next doubler and the tripler you spoke about how uh, people you know the we've given access to all these people but where are the returns you know for the last i think one 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 and a half year stocks have basically gone nowhere if it was i think the last 2 3 months thankfully the index has kind of stabilized but there was a point where i mean entire portfolios were down here i mean people were wondering what has hit you for and i did whatever you told me to do i was patient my sap was there i went yep. on yep. investing i've got nothing to show for it that guy you know went into a fixed deposit he's getting 7 8% and with interest rates going up he's he's looking smarter than me Let's talk about this thing that you spoke about. You know that we got the guys in, but what do we do about returns? You know, so similarly, how is the advice ecosystem shaping out? How do you see you? Uh, how do you see your role in this? And any you know any general thoughts on this? Um, a lot of thoughts, uh, to be very honest. Uh, so, so the first thing is that um, patience is still the key, right? Long term investing is still the key. Index is your gig. Gig, do that. you believe in a fund manager do that but stick with them right the behavior gap happens because a lot of people will look at 3 year 1 year returns get enamored by it invest of course there is some mean reversion that will happen then they will be like oh my god you know this is not the best performing fund in the last 3 years now because i've been holding it for 3 years and it's not the best performing fund i need to switch out right so they are basically buying when the funds have had really good outperformance and then when it mean reverts your performance lags the fund manager's performance right so um one and a half years of no returns is not the problem in my opinion right because uh take a larger picture uh, something that a lot of people will say right um including you know uh, everyone who's even selling quick rich uh, quick uh, rich schemes is 
in the last 20 years nifty has say done 14 15% some large cap fund has done 15 16 17% some small cap fund has done 18% whatever it is right now if you look back at that 20 year period it was not a steady 15% every year it was not a steady 13% every year not even a 10% every year that last 20 years included a 2008 small caps were down 75 yeah, 80% yeah, 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 yeah that time yeah, yeah. Rough, um, very rough. There was 2013, which was included. There. Tempo tantrum, yeah, yeah. There was 2018 that was included. There were small yeah. caps peaked out and then just small caps. Big had correction happened. Big then. correction yeah, happened. Yeah. Right? 2020 is in that 20-year period. But overall in that 20-year period, you still got 2, 3, 4% over FDs if you were patient. right? So I think markets are not going to reward you every month, not going to reward you every six months or every one year. Right. So patience is over a longer time horizon. And the behavior that really needs to be kind of thought through is um, by trying to make money every year, are you actually hurting yourself? Right. The, the, the classic story. Um, I have a friend of a friend and mm-hmm. everyone always mm-hmm. says this. I have a friend of a friend yeah. and <laughs> one day they open their Almira and what do they find? Shares of Vipro. <laughs> untouched. Only and now there are like 3000 X. Mm. There are 3000 X because they were untouched. If they had found it 10 years ago, they would have sold it. Yeah. Right. Um, now, what is happening on the advisory piece, which is the second question and on the industry side. So as a platform, um, I think ET Money is trying how to do advice at scale. Um, it's something that we have always had our eye on. Um, it's a product kind of call as well, because I think to be able to do it on a platform at scale, you need a very robust advisory engine. Right. And and I, I think a lot of it is not very easy to build. But some of these will start getting launched. On the individual side, there are RIAs, um, even though uh, it's not very easy to be an RIA anymore. Um, there are there are a lot of, you know, uh, kind of check boxes that have to be hurdles that are thrown at you out of the blue. Yeah. And yeah. but but they are doing very good job. Right. There's there are few only RIAs and they are basically saying, hey, you know what? We are going to just focus on the sanctity of our advice. And that's pretty much what we're going to do. And there is a space for that. Um, At scale, I don't think anyone has yet cracked what that code will look like, right? Um, It's still on a platform perspective. If I look across all the platforms, right? It's still a product play. It's still an access play. And, 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 And the challenge for a lot of us is how do we get it to be a advisory play in the truest sense of the word like the you know what you said like people should get good returns right that's what matters life's change not because you can trade life's change because now your money is growing at 11 percent instead of growing at three to seven yeah. percent and that's it i mean and i i'll openly agree i don't think i don't see anyone else i mean we haven't cracked it but i don't see anyone who has been able to crack that code to be able to do it at scale now a lot of people are saying, oh, AI, AI and, you know, large language models and all of that will will enable some of this. Um, we'll see. Yeah. I think every new technology comes with a lot of promise, but we'll see. Yeah, and uh, I'm thrilled you mentioned Mukesh Kala of, you know, of uh, ET1 ET because yeah. they've, 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 they've always been doing a lot of good stuff. And yep. again, folks, they, we've done two episodes with them. Check them out in the archive. And it's always in- interesting to get, pe- you know, views from you, from Mukesh, because you guys are a little bit more candid. You could speak about stuff that's under the hood which is might not be very attractive to people who are listening to my episode out there who just who've just got a single view that if you hold your money and you don't do anything else you'll you know you'll become rich that's not how reality is i mean sip is thankfully the number is still looking really good um i don't know what the net number is but at least fourteen thousand crores is still still looking good if, if, even though the market's not gone anywhere and then suddenly see suddenly something like debt mutual funds taxation hits you hmm. let's talk about this i mean yeah. What did you, you know, what are your thoughts when this bomb dropped? I, I'm calling it a bomb because, A, it was not announced in the budget explicitly, hmm. which I believe might have been an option for something that's so serious. And B, it was announced one week before the financial year <laughs> end. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not something, you know, if you're in the investment world, it's not something you want to go to your clients with. No, no. Yeah. I think, uh, and and my view might be, you know, uh, not may not be the majority view, but I, I think sometimes regulation happens in ways which is um, does it make sense? If you ask me the question, you know, um, debt mutual funds are being taxed at whatever, right? The same rate as savings account or FDs, right? 
um does it make sense right from a very intuitive point of view yeah basically the you know the 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 government is now saying that you know either it's a risk taking asset or a non risk taking asset if it's a non risk taking asset it's all going to be clubbed together and we'll have the same taxation now that's fair but the fundamental nature of human beings is if you give me something you can't yank it from me mm. Mm. without having a conversation first you might be right you might have a solid argument for doing that right take a toy from a kid and you will know yeah and that i think was something which obviously caught everyone out of the blue and you know and everyone is like okay even if it makes sense you know there has to be a process under which this is done because suddenly all the asset allocation plans that people have you've thrown them in the mix yeah, yeah. now you can't say that okay everyone should be 100% equity of course everyone shouldn't be 100% equity right but now you've given this kicker that okay now debt funds are going to be taxed at 30% so in effect for me post tax if i normalize across tax before the event and after the event if i have to get the same expected return i am going to be forced to increase my equity risk yeah there is no other way of doing it you're looking at a, at least a 100 to 150 bips extra that you have to search from somewhere otherwise you won't match your goals yeah, exactly uh, it so literally someone who's at a 60 40 allocation now will have to think about a maybe a 68 30 32 allocation right now in the long run on an excel spreadsheet when i do the math when i run the numbers when i do a monte carlo simulation they are the same but they are not the same because equity has spot risk that 68 32 in a 2008 like environment that 68 can fall by 70% yeah drawdown risk is there and equity so, is not there so in if yeah. i need money in that year i don't care about that taxation right so two two things need to happen right one thing is that you can solve it by only two ways one is that okay you bump this up the second thing and i think this is where it gets really interesting now no one talks about this but Uh, and even the even even our uh, you know the the ministry didn't talk about it is are they saying that fundamentally debt yields in the country are artificially low because of the tax break so effectively there is a transfer mm. uh, there is a transfer happening from the taxpayer to the corporates where they are getting cheaper funding because there was a tax arbitrage nice so there is not one way to solve it one way to solve it to say equity badha do aap the other way to solve it is corporate should now pay the true market rent for mm. that capital that they borrowed Very and interesting. that true the true market rent for that capital without the tax arbitrage now is 1 and 1/2% higher so i think what will happen and i'm not and i'm not averse to this outcome what will happen is that corporates cost of borrowing will go up now of course the corporates will come back and say oh my god you know our cost of borrowing is already too high now yeah. you're bumping it higher yeah. it's neither of them is an easier <laughs> solution but um that's the other i mean if i put on a pure economics hat right then i'll say okay yeah, you know what i'm taking out the tax arbitrage because you know because um if you do the math right so effectively what happens is because of the tax arbitrage the taxpayer because our tax collections are low the taxpayer is actually funding even if i'm not buying a debt mutual fund huh. because of the tax arbitrage i am funding that corporates borrowing correct yeah and now they're taking it away yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so different ways of slicing and dicing it um i don't know how the market will find an equilibrium but it will yeah well i mean they and they want to broaden debt markets make it more liquid make it more accessible this is not going to happen <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, this too is too many too many competing <laughs> goals yeah uh, yeah i know and, and yeah so. I, let's not go into that oh, what what did you tell your uh, users when this happened i mean what alternatives did you throw at them so see one thing we thought about that we thought hard about was and we said that yeah see you know what if you are open to an higher equity risk then does it even make any sense to have corporate debt in your portfolio now just have fds or just have corporate fds or you know just go um instead of getting like you know like a 9% from a bond fund if you're getting like 8% from some uh you know an nbfc's fds just do that yeah so um but if you because if you if you're not getting any incremental benefit is that that may be because of tax breaks that may be because of additional uh you know returns then why take that risk at all so effectively just have a pure barbell strategy you, one side of the barbell is where you're taking risk which is your equity portfolio and the other barbell then don't, don't take any risk yeah. don't take credit risk at all because i don't think right now at that at current taxation and because the corporate uh, yields have not changed yet i don't think 
the investor is getting adequately rewarded for that credit risk yeah i know that's uh, i think that's the point even deepak shanar had made on our episode that if i'm taking all the risk for getting the return then the return better be meaty na i mean why, i'm not getting anything for that then why yep. am i even taking that risk exactly. better off in equity for that at uh, least in equity you go in with a clear head knowing yeah, you're taking yeah, risk yeah. and the thing is that a lot of people don't anticipate or even understand that in debt you can lose capital yes and, and credit risk is tricky yeah credit risk when it hits you yeah hits you hard yeah when I mean, you anyway let's not go there because debt is something that i'm i always you know i find it fun also but it's also a little bit complicated to get your um head around okay so where do you see th- where do you see things going forward for platforms such as yours you know for for your model um still free to users from what what yep. i can see yep. and you've been you're about what 5 to 7 years old how yes. old are you know you're among the oldest players out there yeah 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 we were the first platform that made direct mutual funds free yeah. uh, this was back in 2017 yeah um, i think mutual funds for us will continue to be a dire- uh, to be a free product right the revenues will come through other products that we have on our platform or it will come through advisory right now we don't have an advisory suite right which which i like i said i think only et money has an advisory proposition right now um but those are that is not going to change i don't think that direct mutual funds will go down a subscription path or will go down a revenue path i mean um, sebi has come up with a execution only platform framework that allows um, some part of the execution fee that amc's already pay uh, they pay to the um, uh, exchanges today to come to the platforms if that happens that's probably more like a you know an unexpected gift from the regulator for 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 most of us but i don't think that uh, that's going to happen if if a platform believes that they have to monetize mutual funds then regular plans is the way to go for them yeah i you know i've been so i had another i had tawag on the show which actually charges a flat fee per per yep. year what's stopping you i mean you don't think you want to try this out just to what's so you can there? charge an advisory fee if you have a uh, portfolio solution right so it kind of becomes like a pms light in some sense huh. um what we understand is that is something that people are willing to pay even even if you look at how the how et money is constructed their product it is a pms light right they basically say we'll tell you the funds to buy and the stocks to buy and and we'll tell you when to rebalance and and so on and so forth uh-huh. the final decision making is in your hands but we are monitoring it right and that is possible and i think that is something that a lot of platforms will explore but charging purely for access to direct plan like for example you know in, in broking you can say for execution you have to pay me 20 rupees yeah that part is not going to happen is what i meant understood very interesting go up let's get into your favorite topic of behavior and, and <laughs> i i know it's a favorite for you yeah and you were talking about this that uh, rewind 3 years 2020 2021 everything the entire discussion like you had said was about chase returns kya lagta hai what's looking good and you know bhal mein gaya asset allocation and like i am making 100% here i am making 200% there who cares about asset allocation so what was the implication of things then of that behavior then that we are now you know probably playing paying the compensation for now in the longest time i was saying that when this market was going berserk we are just borrowing returns from the future yep. there will come a time when ye sab thanda pad jayega fir sochna kya karna hai tumhe so it's happening now your thoughts um few things right uh very few people actually made blockbuster returns and that's always true most people just paid a lot of fees to whichever platform they were trading on right um so when when someone says right that hey you know what whoever made money trading stocks um my answer is always simple it's the owner of the broking platforms <laughs> and it's a fact you know they 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 minted it in the last two years right uh but the behavior was also not what i would say which would be unexpected very very hard yaar you know when when you show someone that you know you put 500 rupees in a in bitcoin and in two months it can be 50000 right so people start thinking of it as optionality it's no different than people buying kind of lottery tickets right and if it happens to a few people around you if it happens to you know uh, uh then then you think that why not me and straight lining a trend by the way right and and i think we sometimes become very harsh with retail that hey why did you straight line this trend right 500 became 50000 doesn't mean 50000 is going to become 25 lakhs we should have had some common sense mm. but the analysts analysts who analyze companies they straight line trends all the time 
Correct. The easiest thing to do is straight line a trend. Yeah. And when the trend changes, oops, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, for an analyst to say that it's okay because it's not their own money on the line. It's you know in in a in a way, shape, or form, it's OPM, other people's money. But when it's your own money on the line, then who do you say oops to? You stand in front of a mirror and say, "Oops, I made a mistake two years ago, so now I don't have that." And and we are seeing this a lot. And I think some of the flows and some of the reasons why mutual fund flows have sustained is because I think a lot of people get into trading, they burn their hands, then they eventually realize, you know, what an ETF or a mutual fund or a simpler product is better for me because, anyways, I tried my hand at it, didn't turn out as well for me. Um, but I think you know every time there is a lot of free money, whether it's it's by the government or whether it's because of growth or whatever it is, something very similar happens. Right? Similar things happened in the Silicon Valley in late nineties. Oh. Similar thing happened in in the US in two thousand seven, two thousand six, two thousand eight, um, and the same thing got repeated in twenty twenty to twenty twenty two. Right now, the question is how well, as an industry, are we able to absorb the aftermath? of that right because all of these episodes um china is a very good example by the way because if you look at the chinese stock market right between 2003 to 2007 they had a rally of like massive rally like if you look at that chart huge and number of trading uh, accounts in china exploded 2007 so china crashed before 2008 happened so 2008 if you look at the chinese stock market you'll be like oh they did really well yeah because the crash happened one year earlier mm. and the number of trading accounts right In India, we see the same thing, right? That's Correct. the whole concept of dormant DMAT accounts, right? So, so that's why you never look at total number of DMAT accounts. You always look at active, active accounts, right? Yeah. And some of that will happen, and it'll happen again. And I think the challenge for the industry as a whole is that um, how do we get to a place where you can say that hey, you know what? This is we're not selling sugar. We're not selling right. You know, uh, uh, some something just to kind of give you a kick. We're actually selling you something that will actually make you money. And it's a tall ask. Yeah. It's a tall ask because um, doesn't matter who said what, right? Number of active crypto accounts in India exploded to millions in like four months mm. or five months, right? So active, yeah. and and how do you fight that? Almost like a group think where every twenty three to twenty six year old is basically being told if you're not in a, in crypto you're a fool, or if you're not in something else you're a fool, right? And um, so as an industry. does education help education helps but you know sometimes an individual has to go through that experience themselves and then make have that realization for themselves that this is how the world works because uh, you know everyone thinks that the world is different in their age yeah but so let's get to the outlook section now the stock market is not really gone anyway like we were talking what are you recommending to your users in equity you know uh, large mid small sector theme etc What's your messaging to your users right now? See, we've never, we've we've never, you know, picked sectors or themes because we think that that would require a lot more involved portfolio management solutions. I think yeah. PMS, AIF, they are much better suited if you want to do uh, something like that. Um, if you're investing, continue to invest, right? Like I think the the whole idea that goal based investing works, right? What I was t- telling you, uh, what I was talking about earlier, that you look at a twenty year time period, it has had three four crashes, still you got fourteen percent, right? Now. Is there a reason to believe the next twenty years are going to be different? No. Do I have a crystal ball that will tell me what the next three years bring? No. I have my own personal opinions. Correct. But I cannot project them as advice. They are opinions, right? At the end of the day, I believe we are going to be in a sideways correction. So, stock markets can correct in two ways, right? There is the price correction that happens quickly and dramatically. What happened in March twenty twenty, or stock markets can have something which is called a time based correction. Um, Actually, real estate markets are a great example of time-based correction. In a real estate market, prices rarely is a market like India where there is no leverage. If there is leverage built in, all bets are off. But in a market like India where people don't take a lot of leverage to buy homes, prices don't correct; they just don't appreciate. Mm. So they are basically correcting by the rate of inflation year after year after year. So, for example, one crore house in two thousand is still one crore in two thousand twenty. You will say, hey, "No correction, man! I bought for one crore; it's still one crore." Mm. You actually lost close to fifty percent, yeah, yeah, or more, yeah. because of inflation, right? And I think um, my personal opinion is something like that is possible in equity markets, which, for a long-term investor, to be honest, may not be the worst thing, because you want to be you want to be able to accumulate 
you know, you, you want to be able to accumulate when the markets are flat and then when the markets rally, that entire corpus compounds, right? Mm. But what about someone who needs money in five to seven years? They shouldn't have 70-80% in equity anyways. Correct. They should be 70-80% in FDs or debt mutual funds or whatever you prefer, right? So, um, the basic tenets of asset allocation, the basic tenets of, you know, having that level of uh, patience, they don't change whether it's a trending market or a down market or a flat market, right? Because kind of the tenets were built because they worked across market cycles, right? It's much harder to follow them <laughs> in down markets and flat markets. Yeah. So, so any tactical shifts out here? But <coughs> sorry, any tactical shifts out here between large, mid, and small? Because small's been, you know, quite sad. Large has kind of been stable, and mid su- surprisingly has kind of done better than what a lot of people have expected. But any thoughts there? Again, my personal opinion here. Um, I, I just I always say that because you know this 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 is not should not uh, be treated as advice. Yes, yeah. uh, and not. Uh, as a view of the platform. This sure, is what I'm sure. saying as you know, as an investor myself. What I've seen in small caps in India is uh, whenever small caps have outperformed large cap by a significant margin, that gap has closed down, right? And if you've had a significant portion of investment in small caps and you've made a lot of money in the last three to four years, because since 2000, I think 20 small caps have been on a tear massively outperformed large caps, massively outperformed mid caps. If you look at from the 2020 March lows, right? Mm. And you've been able to capture that. Would I say, you know, switch into large cap or mid cap? No, but your future investments, think about kind of saying, okay, you know what? I already have a lot in small caps. Now I need to have more on the large cap and mid cap. And this is what I'm doing personally as well, right? Mm. I mean, most of my newer investments are going into. Um, I do like, uh, as, as, a, as a factor, I do like momentum. But very strictly, I like momentum only in a mutual fund construct. Sure, sure. Don't get into momentum as... Actual stocks. Yeah. As actual stocks, as a thematic basket, the churn and the taxation will kill you. Mm. Because in mutual funds, your churn is tax-free, mm. right? And now we have indices that track that. And I think momentum had a brief crash. Uh, historically, whenever momentum has had a crash the forward returns look really good again in my uh, again these are things that i'm doing in my portfolio so these are all personal sure, opinions. Sure, you sure, can sure. take it with a grain or a bag of salt <laughs> as you please mm. um but momentum is something that i think is is good to accumulate um, and i would say that's pretty much it i think those are those tweaks are enough Do, don't need to do too much don't touch the bar of soap too much that there is no soap left but once in a while just you know mm-hmm. <laughs> dust mm-hmm. off the <laughs> So we actually spoke about the interest rate cycle. Speaking about any views you have on debt, on the debt products that you already said, you, you know that listeners might want to just have a look at um, FD. Any other thoughts there before we move on? Interest rate cycle. I mean, I'm not a macroeconomist. So again, I'm, 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 you know, if I'm wrong, then don't blame me. Sure. <laughs> um, if I look at a simple piece of evidence, right? Uh, if you look at the freight rate from China to Los Angeles, right? That freight rate went up like, I don't know, 8, 9x during the pandemic. Now it is below the 2020 number, right? Long-term average. It's way below that long-term trend. If inflation comes down, there is no reason for the rates to keep on increasing, right? And there are a lot of reasons to believe that that will happen. Um, Are we specifically in a peak of a rate cycle? It's anyone's guess. But all the data that you can think about, which actually affects prices um, will say that you know what maybe inflation doesn't go back to two percent that the fed wants you know maybe in india inflation doesn't go back to whatever four percent or four and a half percent the number that you know uh, our governor tracks but is it going to go materially above seven eight percent um i would bet at no um but yeah I, i'll leave it at that sure and any <coughs> sorry again any other asset class or anything else that we've not tracked so far in terms of asset classes? You know, we've spoken about equity, we've spoken about debt, you've even kind of touched upon real estate, but is that it? I mean, or are you looking at something else? Maybe international, maybe anything else? Um, international actually is very interesting. And um, we've always thought that, you know, if you could have a portion of international assets in your portfolio, that would be phenomenal. And at one point it looked like, wow, right, you can do that. But now LRS has a 20% tax collected at source. So again, it's the same 
you know, the, the, the math just becomes worse and worse and worse with all of these added layers of complexity. So you really have to force the math to work. If you're forcing the math to work, likelihood is very high that in real life it's not going to play out, right? Um, if the mutual fund cap is increased, some mutual funds are still taking international dollars. And, and international diversification makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, the, the rupee, rupee diversification is a real benefit to an investor. And if you if you have access to funds that are still open and they're taking uh, deposits, definitely it's worth investing in. But is it now worth kind of going through all the hoops to send money abroad? I, I don't know because, I mean, some people might justify it for different reasons, but I think that friction of, you know, a 20% TCS is just too high a barrier, mentally for me, to make that leap. Yeah, and that also came out of nowhere. That also came out of nowhere. I, I know, and, and again... <laughs> um, you know they're justified in 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 what, in in how they are thinking about it. But I think my biggest kind of concern always is that, you know, you cannot just same thing. You can't just yank. It just reduces confidence of investors as a whole, on what's the next shoe to drop. Yeah. And if effectively, you want to regulate everyone to just invest in index funds and just say that now the index funds are the only funds <laughs> that will that will survive. That's, yeah. going to, that, that's going to distort the market, you know that. And especially for a very young country like India, he, the to, entire world jumps into index funds, then, you know, it has a lot of impl lot of implications on cost. So, oh, totally, totally. There are limits to everything, right? Yeah. Every strategy has limits. Indexation is good when there is a significant cohort of intelligent price makers. An index fund is, is in effect, a price taker. If everyone is a price taker, the distortions can be immense. I hundred percent agree with that, right? So, yeah. even 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 Bogle says that, right? Like you know, once you once you start, once you get to a point where seventy percent of investors are indexers, then is indexing still the best strategy? Not so sure. Yeah, and he's talking about the U.S. And he's talking about the U.S. The S and P five hundred is the largest index on this entire planet. Exactly. Our market cap is what three trillion now. I don't yeah. know how much it is, but somewhere around those. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh man. These are topics that we don't usually cover on Pesa Pesa, but man, this is really requires a lot of uh, discussion. Anyway, what's happening at Kuwait and what are your future plans? Anything new? Anything exciting? How's you know how 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 are things there? Things good, yeah. We um, we are working. We are co-creating this wealth platform with Amazon Pay. So a lot of work is going into kind of you know making sure that um, that platform can scale, that we can actually kind of you know reach a much larger audience. Um, we are adding more products. We are going to be launching NPS soon because I think uh, given all that has happened, suddenly NPS has now become even more wonderful as a low-cost, long-term investment option for Indians. Mm. So we are going to be launching NPS really soon. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I think slowly and steadily we are going to keep on adding more and more products, more and more partnerships. Uh, yeah, I That's mean, the plan for us. back in 2019, if I had asked you, Gaurav, are you going to be launching NPS in 2023? I think you would have thought about that. It's been boring, totally. dull product. Who's going to... And now look at it. I, I have NPS and I just love it, man. What a simple, transparent, low-cost product that takes care of all my headaches at one shot. Like, jokingly, I'm saying this, but literally, <laughs> we are in a world where you have to think about who will be the last man standing. Oh, <laughs> man. That doesn't just go with that product. Can we at least have a good, you know, let's 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 end the episode on a good <laughs> note. Uh, any content recommendation for a listener? Any book that you're reading, anything you're watching, anything you're seeing, anything at all? Sure, sure. Um, I... I've been recently watching Beef on Netflix. Mm. Absolutely phenomenal. Mm. Uh, uh, really, really well made. I mean, very artistic, very real story. Very well done. Uh, it's of course not a real story, but it comes across as a very real story. Very provocative. I mean, yeah, and, and you know, takes, uh, you know, we talk about road rage in India a lot. And it just takes it to yeah. to the to the extreme yeah. on what road rage can actually become, right? Phenomenal. Yeah. I read this book called Chip Wars. It's about that whole, like, you know, how the semiconductor industry came to be. In Taiwan? Um, so it talks about the whole global semiconductor. So they start with, like, you know, William Shockley. They start back in 1950 and then just builds the whole story on how, how Taiwan became so important in that entire supply chain. How Samsung became, for, for that matter, so important in that supply chain. Um, a very brilliantly written book. So, so that's yeah. TSMC and USMC. I think that's 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 a, the, the the two companies based in Taiwan, right? I mean, Those are the largest ones. Huh. Uh, but then there is a big market, uh, you know. But uh, so they talk about different facets of it, right? So uh, one of the machines that is used, right, to make chips. There is a company in in Netherlands called ASML. They are the only company that makes that 
ಚೈನ್ moves replacement parts are not nowhere to be found yeah and then you have to wait for your cars for like one one years and yes. all that so yeah brilliant yeah. book and and puts th- a lot of things into perspective yeah and i didn't even know that you know that f- so the vistron pegatron foxconn yeah all three who supply to iphone here in india by the way yep these are taiwanese companies these are taiwanese and we are all very thrilled that you know iphones are being made in india and i was like dude those three companies aren't even owned by indians i mean of course they are very much operating in india and if you are benefiting from it we are benefiting a lot from it but wo thappa to apple ka hai you know and of course it's great that's how it will start yeah that's you know, how yeah. because we don't have the technology so yeah. someone yeah. has to come in here for our labor and but that's how taiwan started that's how south yes. korea started yes they yes they come yes. here yes. for the labor and then over generations we get the technology and we improve it and we build on it yeah but i mean that's just the way it's going to be yeah and you know this the store launch yesterday thoda price kam kar denge to acha hoga iphone ka but i don't think that's going to happen it it will it will uh, or good competitors will come up see i mean auto industry exactly the same thing happened right i mean you know now we have so much talent and so much kind of you know technology and so much know how of build, building real cars yeah but initially it was exactly the same yeah it was the same the companies came here looking for a market we had the market looking for cheaper labor and cheaper supply chains we had that we offered them that and they said okay yeah we are going to come in here slowly that you know our guys smart guys hard working people they yeah. cut up the hierarchy they learn stuff the guy who started tsmc used to work um at intel if i'm not wrong sure. right so you know uh, michael chang i think that's his name right so it's a uh, this 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 thing takes a few generations right and and the start will always be the same yeah and but so then suddenly you will have you know tata making an ev in india completely designed and everything and you will be like wow and that is a road ahead for sure that's the road ahead yeah. beef on netflix and chip was the book two recommendations for our listeners and that is a wrap on this episode of paisa paisa my guest gorav rastogi of kuvera gorav thank you so much for doing this for the listeners and coming and you know and going through all the ups and downs of mumbai's traffic and the construction and all that thank you so much yeah thanks anupam pleasure always great to have you here